eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me that I call my own. Through the dark, through the door, through where no one's been before, but it feels like home. They can say it, they can say it all sounds crazy, but it feels like they can say, they can say I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care if they call me crazy. Hey, welcome to Natural Leaders AI Voice Generator, our only application built to assist creators and companies alike. Welcome everyone to another year of NASA's International Observe the Moon Night broadcast, coming to you from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. I'm your host, Lauren Ward, and I am so excited to be part of this celebration with you. International Observe the Moon Night is a time for everyone on Earth to observe the moon, learn about lunar science and exploration, and reflect on the many cultural and personal connections we have to the moon. If you go to our website, moon.nasa.gov forward slash observe, you can find lots of information and resources about this event, including our map of lunar observers all over the world. If you register, you can even add yourself to this map. Every dot you see is a person or group of people observing the moon with you. We also have recommendations of activities you can do at home, links to videos, our moon maps made especially for today, and a new NASA Lunar Citizen Science Project. You can also share how you're observing and find out how others are participating around the world on social media by using the hashtag ObserveTheMoon and by checking out our Flickr gallery. For this year's broadcast, we have a wide variety of videos, visuals, and information to share. We're going to kick things off with a video about NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, which has been collecting an incredible amount of data on our moon since 2009. In fact, International Observe the Moon Night was inspired by the interest in events celebrating the arrival of LRO and its sister mission, NASA's Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or LCROSS. The information from LRO has led to many scientific discoveries that are helping us better understand the moon's history, composition, and potential for future exploration with the Artemis missions. This video highlights some of our recent discoveries that involve impact craters, volcanic activity, and the moon's south pole. Take a look. Since its launch in 2009, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been gathering incredible amounts of data about the moon. This information has led to many scientific discoveries, 
shedding light on the moon's history, composition, and potential for future exploration. One of the most heavily used instruments on LRO is its high-resolution camera system, which is able to capture incredibly detailed images of the lunar surface. By analyzing these images, scientists have been able to gain new insights into the moon's geology and its evolution. For example, LRO has provided new data on how the lunar surface changes as a result of the formation of impact craters. During its years orbiting the moon, LRO's camera has captured the immediate results of meteorite impacts on the surface, such as scattered debris and ejecta patterns on the surface. And since the moon lacks an atmosphere, these newly formed craters remain essentially untouched over many years, allowing LRO to continuously measure and collect data on them. This means scientists can analyze a crater formed a year ago and use it to learn about craters that formed millions or billions of years in the past giving us clues about the Moon's geologic history. We can't replicate this type of study on Mars or on Earth, since atmospheric conditions like wind are rapidly changing the surface. The Moon is therefore a unique environment for learning about our solar system. Another major focus of LRO's mission has been the Moon's South Pole. This region is of particular interest to scientists because of the detection of water which will be a vital resource for future missions to the Moon. The data LRO has collected allows scientists to create detailed maps of the South Pole, leading to the discovery of large regions that appear to contain significant amounts of this water. These discoveries are important because they could help make future missions to the Moon more sustainable. Instead of having to bring all their own water with them, astronauts could potentially extract water from the lunar soil and use it for drinking, cooking, and even rocket fuel. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft is also equipped with a suite of scientific instruments that aid in exploration, including a laser altimeter, called LOLA, that is able to measure the precise elevation of the lunar surface. Using LOLA, scientists have been able to create the most accurate map of the Moon's topography to date, as well as improved lunar gravity models, both of which will help future exploration efforts. Finally, data from LRO has helped us better understand the composition of the lunar surface, shedding new light on the Moon's history. The data has shown that a wider range of compositions of volcanic rocks exist on the lunar surface than previously thought. We have found compositions of rocks that are not part of the Apollo sample collection, and evidence for volcanic activity that may have occurred only 50 million years ago. That's 950 million years after scientists had previously thought it ended. This information helps us piece together a geologic history of the Moon from just after its formation to the present day. Information that will aid in understanding future samples collected by Artemis astronauts. Thanks to the incredible data gathered by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, NASA and the scientific community are making incredible strides in our understanding of the Moon. With every new discovery, we are one step closer to unlocking the secrets of our closest celestial neighbor. Soy Karina y soy de Barranquilla, Colombia. En Barranquilla tenemos una canción dedicada a la luna que dice, la luna de Barranquilla tiene una cosa que maravilla. We are very excited to be celebrating International Observe the Moonlight with NASA. Hey there, we are the Ramin Su and we're saying hello from Madagascar. In our language, Malakasi, the moon is called Fulana. We have this lovely tradition of calling our parents Masonja Mambulan. 
So next time you observe the moon, send your love to the people you cherish the most. Happy, Happy International Observe the Moon Night! Mwah. Mwah. Hi, I'm Isabel from Melbourne, Australia, and we like learning about the moon at school. Happy International Observe the Moon Night! Hi, I'm Henry from Ma from Melbourne, Australia. I like Happy International Observing the Moon Night! <laughs> Hi there, my name is Anne McLean, and I'm an astronaut who has lived and worked 250 miles above the Earth's surface on the International Space Station. Today we're going to be turning our eyes toward the moon and learning more about what causes the moon phases. Now when you're looking up at the moon from the Earth, you'll notice that it looks different from day to day. We call these differences the phases of the moon, and they cycle through every 30 days. Let's check out a demonstration of the moon phases here on the ground. We're going to pretend his head is Earth, letting him view the moon as you would from your home. The ball in their hand is going to represent the moon and the light source is going to be our sun. Keep in mind that while the moon is orbiting Earth, Earth is also rotating on its axis and slowly orbiting the sun. Now, looking from our outsider perspective, we can see the moon is still whole the entire time it is orbiting around Earth, with the side facing the sun always illuminated and reflecting sunlight. Let's take a look at what he is seeing. As you can see in the photographs from Earth's view, the reflection of sunlight looks quite different from this angle, since we are only able to see parts of the reflected sunlight as the moon moves around Earth. This is what causes our moon phases, as the moon orbits around Earth every 30 days. There are names for each of the phases of the moon's 30-day cycle. When the moon looks completely dark, we're experiencing a new moon. This is the beginning of the 30-day cycle, it will move through a waxing crescent phase until it is a first quarter moon. From here, we will see a waxing gibbous until the moon appears fully illuminated. You might have heard this phase before. This is what we call a full moon. After this phase, the moon will go from a waning gibbous phase into a third quarter moon. After the third quarter moon, it will become a waning crescent until it returns to a new moon. On the space station, we see the same moon phases as we do on the Earth's surface. Since the space station is only 250 miles closer to the moon than we are here on the ground, astronauts on the station have the same perspective you have, but don't have the Earth's atmosphere in their way for photographs. Astronauts currently on the space station actually use the moon's phases to collect research that will help NASA with the Artemis program as we work to go forward to the moon with our astronauts by 2024. So, the next time you're outside, take a glance up at the moon to check out what phase it's in. Are you interested in seeing the space station fly by as well? Ask an adult to help you sign up for Spot the Station at spotthestation.nasa.gov. Thanks for learning with me today. See you next time. This evening, you'll see a first quarter moon, a great phase for viewing through a telescope or binoculars. The rugged lunar terrain really pops out along Genius the terminator, which is the line between the light areas and the dark areas on the moon, basically the line between day and night. Even without binoculars, you can observe the terrain that's lit up by the sun and where shadows typically cover. No matter how According you observe the moon, Lawson, you're bound to have questions about yourself. what you see. In this next segment, NASA scientist Jacob Bleacher answers some questions we've gotten on social media about the moon. Hi, I'm Jacob Bleacher. I'm a geologist. That means I study rocks and dirt on the Earth and planets. This is Ask NASA. I'm here to answer your questions. What is unique about the surface of the moon? Well, the moon is quite unique from the Earth. It has no atmosphere. There's no air to breathe. What that means is that the processes that have occurred on the moon are all preserved there in the rocks. For instance, if you look at the moon from the Earth, you may see circles. Those circles are impact craters. Let me show you. Except, making craters is really dirty business. I need my crater making poncho. Now we're ready. Let's pretend this is the surface of the moon. It looks a lot like this. That's one crater, but the surface of the moon has many more. 
Oh, that was a good one. On the moon, these craters have formed over time, and as you saw, material from each crater buries the previous ones, making this very rough terrain. In that terrain, at the pole, there are some craters that we believe have water ice trapped there, and they never see the sunlight. That's good for science, and could also be a resource that helps our astronauts survive. Why study moon rocks? Well, besides the fact that rocks are awesome, each rock is kind of like a person. It has its own fingerprint. We talked about impact craters. That's recorded in the rocks. Whether or not ice or water has been near there, that's recorded in the rocks. It tells us the history of the moon. What tools will astronauts use to explore the moon? Well, hopefully we'll have plenty of tools for them. For instance, something like this. This is a hammer like you would use here on Earth. It's a geologist's best friend. It helps us to break up rocks and select samples. You could also use things like rakes and shovels to help us find the right kind of material to bring home. Eventually, we could be using tools more like this. This tool is an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, or XRF. An XRF basically shoots X-rays at a rock and then detects what comes back. And as I talked about before, rocks have unique fingerprints. This helps us to determine what that fingerprint is. Our astronauts will also use rovers, like this model that you can see right here. These vehicles are designed so that they can help us move around on the surface. Well, this tool is 3D printed, but this is just a model of an XRF. But right now, we're actually testing 3D printers in space on the International Space Station. It'd be really helpful if we can use 3D printers to design the tools that we need. How are we preparing astronauts to investigate the moon's surface? Well, we have to practice here on Earth. The way we do that is we talk to them in laboratory and classrooms, and we also take them out into the field, places like Hawaii or Iceland or Arizona. Places where there are similarities to what they might experience on the lunar surface. We're really excited to send humans to the moon with the Artemis program. That is a great question. The first thing that's going to be very different is that during Apollo, the sun was overhead. But at the South Pole, the sun is always going to be right on the horizon. That means we'll have really long shadows and areas that are very dark. It's going to be very different. We really are exploring a brand new terrain where no one has ever been. The studies we'll be trying to do are looking at and understanding perhaps the water cycle on the moon. And we really want to understand the processes that lead to that water being preserved there. Ooh, that's an intriguing question. Um, first of all, we can see fairly deep into the interior of the moon by looking into craters. That's kind of our natural laboratory for getting at the inside of the crater. Every time a crater forms, there's an explosion that moves rock up and out from inside of the moon. So our astronauts walking around the rim of the craters can pick up rocks that came from deep inside. So the bigger the crater, the deeper the rocks. Well, in fact, we are aiming for farther out. Eventually, we want to get to Mars. But first, we're going to go to the moon and learn some really important answers to questions that will help us survive the trip out to Mars here, because I guarantee you I'm going to have a lot of questions for them when they get back. Do you have a question for NASA? Send your questions to our experts using hashtag AskNASA. In 2024, NASA will be landing its first robotic rover on the lunar surface at the moon's south pole. This mission is called VIPER, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. This mobile robot will help us find and map locations of water ice, an essential resource for astronauts to have for long-term exploration. VIPER will operate in an area near the western rim of the Nobile Crater. The landing site sits on top of a large, flat-topped mountain. Earlier this year, the mountain was given the official name of Mons Mouton. To see why, check out this next video. Melba Mouton, an award-winning mathematician, computer programmer, and African-American trailblazer, is being honored with the naming of a mountain at the moon's South Pole. To recognize her contributions to the agency, NASA proposed the name Mons Mouton for the lunar landing site and exploration area for Viper, its first robotic moon rover. In the late 1950s, Mouton became the head mathematician of a team of human computers that tracked communication satellites in Earth's orbit. 
She was instrumental in coding computer programs that calculated spacecraft trajectories and locations. Before retiring, she was recognized with a NASA award for her calculations of complex mathematical data that contributed to the successful Apollo 11 moon landing. Mons Mouton is a mountain that stretches roughly 2,700 square miles and has an elevation of more than 19,000 feet. It's about the height of Denali, the highest mountain peak in North America. The lunar landmark can be seen from Earth with a telescope. Viper will embark on a 100-day journey at Mons Mouton. The rover will explore the moon's surface to help gain a better understanding of the origin of lunar water, as well as map potential resources, which will help inform future landing sites under NASA's Artemis program. Melba Mouton's legacy lives on at the highest peak in the lunar south pole, bringing NASA a step closer to its goal for a long-term presence on the moon. From the Apollo missions to LRO, Viper, and Artemis, the Moon is a central part of NASA's exploration efforts. But why is that? Here's a video with some answers and a preview of what's in store for the future. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned reality with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the lunar south pole to establish the Artemis base camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes.